Hello and welcome back to everyone joining the next event, our opening day at Climate Week NYC 2020, COP26 and the Zero Carbon Growth Agenda. At the Climate Group, we are delighted to be working with the high-level climate champions Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz on this important moment on the way to COP26 in Glasgow next November. We're going to hear from incredible global figures, city leaders and CEOs of some of the world's most significant companies. They're going to share with us their insights and optimism for our progress towards a healthier, fairer and more resilient future. A green recovery can help us revive the economy and create millions of jobs while promoting our health and social well-being and ultimately lead us to a more resilient net zero future. We must continue to pick up speed and momentum as we work towards COP26. These two weeks in Glasgow will be a pivotal moment in time for our community. However, we also need to see every single day until then as an opportunity to make bolder commitments and take stronger action. On that note, it's my great pleasure to introduce our opening keynote, Alok Sharma, COP26 President and UK Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Last week, Facebook announced science-based emissions reductions targets, including a commitment to net zero by 2030. And today, I'm delighted that building materials firm Lafarge Holcim has committed to developing the world's first net zero roadmap in the cement sector. While CP Group, one of Asia's largest conglomerates and food companies, has also joined the same UN business ambition for 1.5 degrees campaign. These are just three examples of the leadership and ambition we have seen from business in tackling climate change. We've come a long way, not least in the past year. But over the next 14 months to COP26, I am calling on the world to up its ambition because we're at a critical moment. The clock is ticking on climate action. Temperatures are soaring, storms are raging, and crops are failing. And if we do not take this chance, every single one of us will be affected. We all have a part to play. Countries, regions, businesses, people. Together, through our collective effort, we can make a difference in tackling the climate crisis. By shifting investment, spurring innovation, scaling up technologies and driving down costs. Renewable technologies are the proof. Every time the global deployment of solar has doubled, its costs have fallen by almost 30%. As COP26 president, I am urging all countries to submit more ambitious nationally determined contributions, to pledge to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible, to consider adaptation in all planning decisions, and to honour their pre-2020 commitments on mitigation. And on the totemic 100 billion finance dollar goal for climate finance. And it's not just countries that need to act, we need companies, regions and civil society to continue what they already have started, to reduce emissions and adapt to climate change. So I have four concrete asks. First, on clean energy, I'm asking companies to join the likes of H&M, Panasonic and HSBC and to commit to using 100% renewable energy by 2050 at the latest through the RE100 initiative. And cities, regions and businesses, please join the likes of California, New York, New Taipei City and Rotterdam to end the use of polluting coal power. Join the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Second, zero emission road transport. Join the EV100 campaign. Commit to operating or supporting zero emissions vehicles by 2030. WIPRO, Lyft, EDF and many others are already on board. Third, for all you bankers and asset managers, financiers and insurers, please follow the TCFD disclosure recommendations to green the financial system. My fourth and final ask is of you all. Businesses, regions, cities and civil society organisations, please join the great city of New York and many others in the Race to Zero Coalition and commit to reaching net zero by 2050 at the latest. And I'm delighted that Brambles, PayPal and uh, Mastercard are now part of Race to Zero. In New York Climate Week, we have a real opportunity to go faster on climate action and we'll all benefit through sustainable businesses, cleaner air in our cities, and a brighter future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.
Thank you, Minister Sharma, for your inspiring calls to action. I hope everyone was taking notes. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome the Executive Secretary of United Nations Climate Change, Patricia Espinosa. Executive Secretary, over to you. I would like to begin by thanking Minister Sharma for his message, and I would like to recognize the Race to Zero participants and the organizers, the high-level champions of Chile and the United Kingdom, Gonzalo Muñoz and Nigel Topping, the Business Ambition for 1.5 Degrees campaign, the members of C40, the Asset Owners Alliance, and the Under Two Coalition. The last six months have been a nightmare for many throughout the world. COVID-19 has altered lives, economies, and the nature of business on every continent, from the largest cities to the smallest villages. What was once simply theoretical, a global emergency in our lifetimes, something that most of us could only imagine has now happened. It came without warning, it came rapidly, and we were unprepared. The resilience and fortitude of the human spirit, however, is helping us fight back. Seen in the heroism of healthcare workers, the valor of community caregivers, and the ingenuity of scientists who are working hard on a vaccine and getting closer each day. It has also led to introspection. Leaders throughout the world have asked themselves, are we caught in the short-term decision-making cycle or do we have the long-term in mind? Is the way the world has done business, frankly, bad business? If so, how do we transform it? They're the same questions we face with respect to the world's climate crisis. For centuries, humanity has poisoned the land, sea, and air, and hoped the consequences would simply evaporate. But the crisis is still here. It's getting worse, and we must deal with it regardless of COVID-19. The difference between the two crises, most didn't see COVID coming, but we've had decades of warning about climate change. It's like a hurricane creeping towards us, one picking viciously and deadly force. It's not a question of it, but when, and what we are willing to do about it. So far, the answer has been not enough. The good news is that this convergence of these two global crises has opened a window of opportunity, not simply to recover from a virus, not simply shove us back on a loop of consumption and consequence, but to get it right this time, to build forward, to truly build cities and communities that are safe, healthy, clean, green, and more sustainable. Those of you involved in the Race to Zero have made a commitment to build that future and to achieve specific goals you will be held to those promises. The world cannot afford to be let down, not now. Nor can this campaign become something that allows nations to defer action until a later day. It's about needing more climate ambition and climate action now, in 2020. Specifically, the Race to Zero must help spur strong enhanced national climate action plans or NDCs due this year. It's vital that this NDC focus remain front and center. The good news is that both the NDCs and the Race to Zero campaign are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they reinforce each other. The NDCs offer an excellent opportunity for nations to specifically define their path to zero emissions. For those just learning about this campaign, I draw your attention to an important detail. There are several companies on this list. Some will be added today that are from traditionally high emitting industries. Some of them are among those hit hardest by COVID-19. I believe they know that despite whatever challenges we're currently facing, that the climate emergency is urgent, 
and something that cannot be ignored any longer. Let other companies, let other investors, let other regions, let other leaders, and let all people see this commitment and follow their example. And let them see that the path to recovery must be healthy, resilient, and in line with zero emissions. Preventing the spread of infection has been the most effective approach to the pandemic. Preventing future emissions is the most effective approach to addressing climate change. Dear friends, COVID-19 has taught us that societies can, when necessary, pull together to address a global challenge with bold responses. But this cannot be done in isolation. It must be a global collaborative effort. Multilateralism and collaboration have always and will always lead to success. Whether it's repairing the ozone layer or defeating polio in Africa, the capacity of humanity for positive change is infinite. Let this Race to Zero campaign continue to embrace this idea of bringing together groups in unprecedented ways to address the global emergency of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for your strong leadership. Um, we, we are here because we, we're all working toward uh, together something uh, towards uh, something important. We know that the impacts of climate change are already being experienced across the world and the global pandemic has forced us to confront the pain of, uh, of loss of life and livelihoods. This is a race to a healthier, fairer, more resilient, zero carbon future, mobilizing leadership and support from businesses, cities, states, regions, and investors, all committed to achieving a zero carbon economy by 2050 at the latest. But it is a lot more than a race to zero carbon. Climate change, threatens to amplify existing inequalities and to severely impact our most, most vulnerable. So achieving net zero comes hand in hand with delivering a future that is fair for all people and communities that delivers sustainable growth and better jobs and give us all the resilience we need to face future challenges. People are at the heart of this race and we have seen that clearly younger generation who have raised all of our awareness for the need to build more sustainable and just societies to build back better. That is why it's so exciting to have a panel here today that showcases the strength of our collective ambition to have CEOs next to doctors and majors all united with the common goal to deliver our net, net zero future. So to open this session, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies and 108th Major of New York City. He is also the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action. I think it is especially fitting that we hear from him now in this moment of global crisis. Mike is no stranger to taking on major challenges. He's mobilized partners and made a crucial difference on most pressing issues that we face from climate change to public health to economic opportunity. I know we can all benefit from his experience today, so it is my pleasure to welcome him. Mike. Hello and thank you, Gonzalo, for that kind introduction and for all your strong leadership on climate. Let me also thank Nigel Topping, the United Kingdom and the United Nations for their continued leadership as well. I'm glad to help kick off the panel, and this climate week is unlike any other before it. Governments are confronting a historic pandemic that has ravaged communities and devastated their economies. Plus, some countries, including the United States, are seeing waves of public protests. But as the old adage goes, every crisis is an opportunity, and we can't afford to miss it. Together, we have an opportunity to craft a recovery that can strengthen public health, and rebuild economies so they are stronger and more equitable, and fight climate change. Each of those challenges is connected, and to accomplish one, we have to tackle all three. And at the center of it all lies the need to accelerate the transition to a 100% clean energy economy. Ideally, all leaders around the world would be spearheading this effort. 
but we don't live in a perfect world. We know some national leaders drag their feet or even try to drag their countries backwards, as we see here in the U.S. We can't afford to wait for these leaders to see the light. Communities are rebuilding from the pandemic and the devastation of climate change now. And there are smart investments that non-state actors can make right away with the right resources at their disposal. I'll share an example of the progress we're driving from the ground up. When President Trump announced he would pull the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the governor of California, Jerry Brown, and I quickly formed an initiative that we called America's Pledge. It brings together over 4,000 U.S. cities, states, businesses, and local groups that have remained committed to fulfilling the promise our government made under the Paris Agreement. To give you a better sense of our size, this group represents nearly 70% of the U.S. population and gross domestic product. If we were our own country, we would have one of the largest economies of any nation in the world. Even though we may not make a lot of headlines, we've been making a lot of progress. And even though the White House isn't measuring and tackling U.S. climate actions, we are. In fact, we've just released our latest report, and it shows we've made more progress in the past four years than ever before. Of course, we could accomplish a lot more, a lot faster, if our federal government worked with us instead of against us. Thankfully, many other national governments are leading. The more they can empower cities, states, and businesses, the more progress they'll make, and the more we can show the public that fighting climate change betters their everyday lives. By cleaning the air they breathe and the water they drink and creating more good jobs and improving their quality of life, the more success we'll have together. When I served as mayor in New York City, we made a big impact by greening the buildings and transportation sectors. Our foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, in partnership with C40 and the Global Covenant of Mayors, have helped lead city climate actions all over the world. We've also helped drive the successful Beyond Coal campaign, which has expanded to Europe, Australia, and now to South Korea. Here in the U.S., we're working to close all of America's coal-powered plants within the next 10 years and replace them with clean energy. So from experience, I can tell you that it's possible to reduce air pollution, improve health, extend people's lives, fight the climate crisis, and grow local economies. We don't have to choose just one of those outcomes. They all really go hand in hand. With that, I'll turn it back over to Gonzalo to open up the discussion. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, with that, I would like uh, now to welcome Dr. Evin Kumar, founder and managing trustee of the Lanker Commission, and Major Yvonne Akisari of, of Freetown, Sierra Leone, as our first uh, panel of the day. So welcome to you both. Um, let, let me start with Dr. Kumar. Uh, as you have been a strong advocate for tackling air pollution for many years, and we have often highlighted the powerful linkages between human health and planetary health. How do you think we can build back from coronavirus in a way that addresses both of these issues? I'll give you two evidences. A paper published by the Italian Society of Environmental Medicine suggests that the rapid increase of contagion rates that affected northern Italy was actually related to the high PM2.5 levels there, which was acting as a courier. As another study from Harvard reported that for every one microgram per meter cube increase in PM2.5, there was an 8% increase in COVID-19 mortality. What frightens me is how quickly we are forgetting the devastation caused by the pandemic and only talking about building back the economy. Now, this is not the first human pandemic that humanity has faced, and certainly this is not the last one. If you re go back in the last 10 years, you'll realize that there has been an increase in diseases where the infection actually has come from the animals to the human beings. Nipah virus, Zika, Ebola, Hunter, Swine Flu, SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. These are all actually animal virus which have jumped species and come to human beings. Why is it happening? The reason is our activities have led to deforestation, loss of natural habitat and biodiversity, and temperature changes, all of which are causing animal migration, increased animal-human interaction, and 
transmission of these animal viruses to human beings. As we recover, we must prioritize health over economy. And when I say health, I mean the health of human beings as well as the health of our planet. And if we don't do so today, we should be prepared for bigger health crisis in the future. I'm not at all saying that the world should come to a standstill, but we must see what habits can we change? How can companies and individuals reduce emissions? How can we build on the innovation sparked by COVID-19? And can health be a part of every economic discussion? And can we focus more and more towards green technologies? Thank you so much, Dr. Let me go now to Major Akisari. You, you have spoken before about how your Transform Freetown initiative has been fundamental in improving climate mitigation and resilience building in Freetown, especially through community engagement. Can you please tell us a little bit more about how community engagement has helped in efforts uh, to tackle both coronavirus and climate change? This was very much at the heart of um, how we approached Transform Freetown which starts off and my journey really starts from the from climate um particularly the environmental damage um that we that, you know we were experiencing in our city but as we looked towards addressing these one realized that you need an integrated approach to urban development you need an integrated approach which speaks to the environment but also to sanitation dr kumar talked about you know clean air and 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 clean water so you're talking about water, you're talking about health. That links in with skills, it links in with job creation. Where are your jobs coming from? How are they linked into the green economy or not? What is driving those jobs? Um, it links into urban mobility, which is really important for the success of any city. How is your urban mobility, you know, powered? You know, is it by, you, uh, uh, um, polluting vehicles, old vehicles, or is it through green technology? So the solution to the development of a city has to be underpinned in this time of climate crisis with interventions which are speaking to climate improvement. You particularly uh, um, uh, mentioned climate mitigation, and that's something I'm really passionate about. So we find ourselves as a small city relative terms, 1.2 million people in the global south as not being a massive polluter um, in relative terms, but we definitely are um, feeling the impact of climate change, perhaps in a way where cities who are massive polluters are not yet experiencing directly. But I'm not, I'm not naive. I realize that the sorts of weather patterns that we're seeing now, no matter how good your flood mitigation activities are, how clean your gutters are, how you empty your waterways. With heavy rainfall um, of the levels that we are seeing around the world, you can still be you know, covered by water. This brings me then to our trees. And this is where we are contributing, again through community, um, with our Freetown the Tree Town, investing in planting a million trees. Um, we've started. The first 500 seedlings uh, literally are going into the ground um, and we are nurturing the trees, not just planting, but nurturing it. So every resident in the city has the opportunity to be a tree steward. And we're using a tracking app to make sure we monitor the growth of the trees so that we actually are helping to clean the environment, helping to protect the water sources, all of which have been really important when you talk about COVID as well. Thank you, Major. Um, and thank you, you mentioned uh, mobility in the city. So Dr. Kumar, you've spoken about how new boards in many cities across the world become smokers with their first breath as a result of air pollution. Well, what kind of world do you think they deserve to live in instead and how do we get there? Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, you might be wondering what a doctor is doing on such a platform talking about air pollution and climate change. The truth is, that air pollution is not just a chemical issue, it's a big health issue. In fact, it's a public health emergency. It's a silent killer, which is calling, causing millions of premature deaths, diseases, disabilities, and colossal economic loss across the world. 
I am a chest surgeon and what I have witnessed in my operation room scares me terribly about the future of our next generation. When I started my operation career way back in 1980s, I used to see mostly pink lungs and black lungs only when I operate on smokers. But today, almost all my patients, smokers as well as so-called non-smokers, most of them have toxic black deposits on their lungs due to the polluted air they breathe. What shook me was an incident about five years back when I was operating on a 14-year-old boy from a non-smoker family and I saw black deposits on his lungs as well. Now tell me if a child has toxic deposits on his lungs at the age of 14, what kind of life can we expect when he grows older? Even more horrifying experience for me was to tell the family members of a 28 years old girl from a non-smoking family that she has stage 4 lung cancer. They were horrified. Now lung cancer is typically described in the age group of 50s and 60s with long smoking history. But today 50% of my lung cancer patients are non-smokers and I'm seeing more and more women and I'm seeing more and more people in 40s, some of them even in 30s. Today, more than 90% of the children breathe toxic polluted air. Now, studies have proved that air pollution starts its damage from the mother's womb and affects every organ in our body. So from congenital defects and retarded growth in the mother's womb to stunted lung and overall growth, lower IQ, premature hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cancers, increased infections. It's actually ruining the health of our next generation. When I was a child, my father used to ask me to go out and play. But today, parents are scared when their children go out to play in this toxic air. They're putting restrictions on the children and the children are unable to play for months when the pollution levels are high. Schools have to be often shut due to extremely high levels of pollution. Is this the life we wanted to give to our children? A life where they can't even become healthy individuals? A life where they can't achieve their cognitive and physical capabilities? A life where they can't even go to school or play in the playground? Friends, Children deserve healthy, clean air. And we have to make a decision today. Do we want our children to be able to go out and play and grow as a healthy individual? Or do we want to focus only on economic activities, give them a lot of money, but no freedom and no health to enjoy with that money? Friends, the choice is ours. We as individuals, Corporates, policy makers, and most importantly, as parents have to decide today, the time to act is now. And mind you, the time is running out very fast. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor, for such wise words. Uh, so major in that same sense, you have also raised awareness about the importance of our mindsets when we confront like this and you mentioned turning dissatisfaction into action. How do you think mm. leaders can use this mindset as we all work to really build back better? I think one of the, the challenges that um, we're faced with is the level of complexity um, of the problems. So whether it's climate change in, uh, as, a, as a leader, as a, as a city leader, whether it's climate change, whether it's migration, whether it's the economy, um, and, and even at, at a personal level, and I, you know, speaking here to those who might be listening, where you feel it's just too much, you know, what can I possibly do that's going to make a difference? Um, and I think it's a question, that, that question that you posed to yourself, the answer is to start with what you can do. Um, Dr. Kuma has painted a really, really vivid image of cities with pollution um, and for myself as a city leader, and I became a city leader 
because of my concern with sanitation. Um, it started with a concern with the environment and the massive deforestation that my city saw and wanting to do something about it. We all find ourselves in different places and we all have different levels of influence, different spheres of influence, but each of us every day makes decisions that can make a difference. And I think from a perspective of leaders, what we need to do, and you're already doing it, but by virtue of being a leader, you've already taken a step to say, I am dissatisfied with the status quo. And in these days of climate crisis, I, I suppose what I would want to encourage, um, along with others on this, you know, this week, in this climate week, is for us to continue to maintain that sense of urgency, but to do so knowing that it's not all doom and gloom. We can make a difference. We can be dissatisfied and take a step um, and collective steps, but taking those steps always, I believe, bringing others along because the scale of the problem is massive, but it's not insurmountable. We're on a countdown to zero. Time is not in our favor. We need to act now, but by acting now individually, we can still save our earth and provide that future that our children and the young people who are out on the streets already, the future that they deserve. Thank you so much, Major, for those words. And let me thank both of you, Dr. Rabin Kumar and Major Yvonne Akisawa for not only joining us, but also for giving such a wise and, and fundamental perspective of the crisis that we are living in. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, I want to acknowledge your personal leadership and say what an honor it is to be working with you in a North-South partnership of climate action champions. And so the race to zero is the race to a healthier, cleaner, fairer, more resilient economy. And as we build back better, this is the new growth and innovation agenda. Today, we're going to hear from the leaders of five iconic companies leading this agenda. Companies which together are helping to build, move, feed, connect and inspire a zero carbon world. Each is a sector leader. Each is setting the highest level of climate ambition by joining the race to zero via the business ambition for 1.5 degrees campaign. And each is an active part in a global story of systems transformation. And what's more, taken together, they show that the race to zero is technologically achievable, economically vital as we recover from COVID and societally desirable in building resilience to systemic shocks, producing healthier communities and creating better, more durable jobs in industries with a huge role in the future. So with that, I'd like to welcome Jan Jenisch, the CEO of Lafarge Holcim, the world's largest cement company, Cynthia Williams, Director of Sustainability, Homologation and Compliance at Ford. Superchai Chiaravanon, CEO of CP Group, Asia's leading conglomerate serving consumers in 85 countries and known as the kitchen of the world. Brad Smith, President of Microsoft Core, one of the world's leading technology companies. And Jean-Paul Agon, the CEO of L'Oreal, the world's largest cosmetics and beauty brand that's part of the daily life of hundreds of millions of women and men. Realizing a zero carbon future means dramatically changing how we plan, construct and retrofit our built environment. Cement is an integral part of that story. It's the second most consumed product globally after water. It's a sector that's among the hardest to decarbonize and solving that really matters given the fundamental role in creating the infrastructure we'll need to house a growing population amid shifts in energy and mobility demand. The industry has also been hit hard by the pandemic. That's why the decision by Lafarge Holson, the largest cement company in the world, to get to net zero by 2050 is such a consequential act of leadership. So Jan, we're talking here about a massive system-wide transformation how is this technologically possible? And with a global recession looming, how can Lafarge Horsham afford to do this? I believe 
in building a world that works for people and the planet. That's why we are reinventing the way the world builds to make it greener, driving low carbon and driving circular solutions. As the global leader in our industry, we have uh, the responsibility to address today's climate crisis with concrete um, being the world's most used material after water, we clearly need to be part of the solution. Uh, we are committed to turning today's crisis into an opportunity to accelerate uh, green construction. As policymakers choose where to invest in the recovery, building is a natural option. Building creates jobs almost immediately and in the residential sector homes. When it comes to building infrastructure, uh, the case is even stronger. Uh, according to a report by the World Bank, uh, every dollar of GDP invested in infrastructure increases economic output by a dollar and a half in just uh, four years' time. That effect is even stronger in low and middle income countries. As an investment in uh, this economic growth, building is hard to beat. Now is the time to make green construction a reality for all by prioritizing low carbon and circular solutions. We are also providing high performance materials to build dams for hydropower and protecting shores for coastal resilience. Um, another example is our first uh, cement uh, called Sustaino, which is using also recycled uh, construction waste. Uh, Sustaino was launched in Switzerland um, a year ago and it's using around 20% of recycled materials, which is grinded into the cement and is used as a fresh building material. So we are very proud to have uh, these two products launched, uh, the first recycling cement Sustaino and uh, the recycling concrete range of EcoPact, which uh, will start to change the world how we built. Um, that's why governments have a key role to play by putting the right policies, policies in place so that we can fully roll out all these uh, environmentally friendly solutions. It's great to see policies like the Green New Deal in Europe committing to reach net zero by 2050 with many cities around the world coming on board. Europe is clearly leading the way at the moment. It would be great to see this movement scale up globally. All of us in the building industry must continue to innovate in materials, processes and technologies. I personally will not stop uh, pushing our company and the boundaries in this area. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think you paid a lovely story of the importance of the built environment sector in um, in a green resilient recovery in uh, addressing climate change, of course, but also development in the global south, as you've mentioned, and in creating jobs. And you also described love beautifully what we call the ambition loop that the sector can only move so far and then you need policy support both at national and at city level. I also think um, not, not so many people are aware of just how much innovation is going on in, in, in what sometimes looks yeah. like a 2000 year old sector. So it's great to hear some of those stories. I just, so you talked about the whole sector and some examples, but obviously you have to take the investors with you if you're going to go through such a transformation. So yeah. maybe just say a little bit about how, um, you know, how when you're talking to investors, you paint the picture of this commitment to net zero that you've made um, and the innovation that you, path that you're on, putting the company in a stronger commercial and financial position so that the investors support you in that journey. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a great question. And, and of course, it's uh, challenging to uh, con convince the investors right away because investors are, are, are best convinced by by doing and by achieving things. Uh, and this is what, what we have to do now. You know, I can talk a lot, but it's much more powerful to see now the new concrete range of EcoPact uh, using one third of fully recycled uh, uh, building waste uh, by launching a, a cement, which using 20% of uh, also recycled building waste. I think these are the right answers I want to see uh, on the construction sites of uh, this world to uh, make uh, a greener construction a reality. Uh, 
for the investors, I think a challenge for us is to uh, explain the different level of policies we see in different geographies, right? We, at the moment, uh, Europe is clearly the front runner in policy making. And uh, now we have to see how other parts of the world are following or maybe uh, even starting up stronger policies and programs. And that's a challenge for us. But but again, we are we are positive. We, we also, um, I would say, accelerated our efforts uh, recently, let's say one or two years ago, when we really uh, see we need to play a much more active role, uh, launch these new products and make our operation much lower CO2 and much uh, lower fossil fuel based. And uh, we are now on the way to do that. And this is why I'm uh, so excited also to talk about this today and uh, also to talk about uh, uh, the pledge we are doing here for your conference. Great. Th thanks. And great to have you, Lafarge Holson, the biggest cement company in the world in the race to zero. Thank you so much for your, for your thoughts on leading the transition. Our next panelist brings us a global perspective on the radical transformation that's changing the way we move people and goods around towns, cities, and the planet. A zero carbon transportation system with electric mobility at its core, not only confronts one of the biggest sources of carbon pollution, but can also create 15 million new jobs and save millions of lives by helping move countries to cleaner, healthier economies. Ford is the first full line US automaker to commit to net zero by 2050 with interim science-based emissions reduction targets. It's investing more than $11.5 billion in electric vehicles through 2022 and is on track to power all its manufacturing plants with 100% locally sourced renewable energy by 2035. So Cynthia, it's great to have you with us. Tell me, what motivated Ford to set such an ambitious goal? And what changes will this involve? Thanks, Nigel. I believe Ford believes that climate change is real and we need to do our part to address it. Above all, Ford wants to make a positive impact on society. To achieve carbon neutrality, we, we will need to find a balance between our, our carbon emissions that we emit from our facilities and vehicles and carbon re removal. We will focus on three aspects uh, of that. About 95% of our CO2 emissions come from vehicle use, our supply base, and our facilities. So that's our primary concentration. We, rec we recognize we can't do this alone. There will be outside um, key uh, stakeholders that we will need to engage to address some of the key challenges, such as customer acceptance of EVs, government policies, their economic factors outside of our control. But again, we're committed to work with the key stakers to, to, to address these challenges. On our path to carbon neutrality by 2050, we will set interim targets. And we're, we're aligning with uh, external uh, third party source, uh, it's science-based targets initiative uh, to address our scope one emissions. These targets will be reassessed every five years, but we're committed to doing our part. Thank you. Uh, I love the, 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 the clarity of the three pronged approach, like the vehicles, suppliers and facilities. I mean, we tend to think of the vehicles as the most um, iconic and significant because we see them on the streets. But as you say, you have huge influence through your, your facilities and through your supply base as well. Mm -hmm. So just to, just to follow up, um, Cindy, this is, a, this is a big commitment and a big transformation. Um, uh, how do you see this as actually giving Ford a competitive edge? And what kind of exciting things can we expect to see from Ford over the next 12 months? Well, I think our strongest differentiator uh, from our competitors, in my view, is our electrification strategy. Uh, that, that's the strategy we've dr dramatically changed. Uh, we are playing to our strengths, pickups, performance vehicles, and utilities, segments where we are strong and our margins are good. 
We'll build on our iconic brands, our Mustang, our F-150, and our transit in Europe. We know uh, what these loyal customers expect, and we will amplify the attributes that they love, whether it's performance, it's torque, or capability. We're leveraging our scale and technology. The Mach-E you'll see later this year, and the F-150 BEV will be coming soon. Um, well, thank you, Cynthia. It's, it's very exciting. I, I, I worked in the automotive sector early in my career and spent quite a bit of time in America, and you can't turn the street corner without seeing F-150s um, every, everywhere. So it's really, it was an iconic iconic vehicle. Great to see that. And, and, and I think that the Mustang is going to turn heads everywhere. As you said, so I think we're, we're, we've gone a long way from the idea that electrifying transport was going to make it boring. Um, and, and I think Ford is proving that with the, with the work you're doing. So thank you so much for your leadership and for joining the Race to Zero. Thank you. Thank you for, for having us on today. We really appreciate it. And i um, glad we could, 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 could join you today. Now, shifting to a healthier, fairer, more sustainable and more resilient global food system is one of the greatest challenges society faces. CP Group has announced today its commitment to be net zero across the whole group by 2050. That's a huge act of global leadership and a signal to Asian businesses of what climate leadership looks like. Given the lateness of the hour in Thailand right now, I put two questions to Mr. Superchai Chiravanong the CEO of CP Group, earlier today. Firstly, Superchai, the CP Group is active across pretty much every part of the food system, from producing, processing, packaging to distribution. So how do you see the transition to zero carbon transforming the global food supply chains and what opportunities does that create? And my second question is, what motivates you to do that? And could you give us an insight into how you're applying technology and innovation to address these challenges and to balance food security, human health and environment considerations? Thank you for the introduction, Nigel. And for your questions, it is an honour for CP Group to participate in this important event. Climate change is certainly an issue close to our heart. Let me start with your first question. It is true that as a conglomerate, CP Group business covers a wide range of industries. We have seen both threats and opportunities in many aspects. For agriculture, we need a rapid transition. Southeast Asia has been negatively impacted by extreme weather conditions. Today, flood and forest fire are more common and severe. We have also become a large contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. As a conglomerate, CP Group's core business lies in agri-food. We need to help the agriculture sector transition to net zero carbon. We need to adopt efficient farming practice and energy saving methods. Reducing food waste will require support from consumers and partners across the supply chain. Raising awareness through education, leadership, insight and outside of our own organization and partnership will help make this a reality. To your point about the opportunities the transitions to zero carbon can create, in my view, new technological enhancements will enable our system to operate more efficiently. For example, digitalization will ensure transparency and traceabilities throughout the supply chain. We have to apply technology to empower farmers who are our close partners. Through technology, we also upskill and reskill our 350,000 employees worldwide. Lastly, I wish to emphasize that CP Group aims to transform the food systems so that we provide food in a healthy and sustainable way. Turning to our second question about the motivation behind CP Group ambitions, I have been motivated by the fact that the global threat of climate change is real, recognizing that the biosphere we live in is extremely fragile. Here in Thailand, 
and throughout this region. We have seen firsthand its impact on the agriculture, tourism, as well as human health. To your questions about technology and innovation, CP Group is approaching our 100 years anniversary next year. And innovation has been an important part of our business from the start. We have digitized our operations to unlock both sustainable practices and business values. Our supply chain management is more transparent and integrated. CP Group also partners with technology startups. We are now in a position to offer consumers more sustainable options, leading them towards sustainable lifestyle. I recognize the importance of being part of the solution to the crisis of our own making. The way we produce and consume is not sustainable. In fact, neutral carbon footprint should be one of the key KPIs apply to all listed company in all stock exchanges to lead the change at scale. I truly believe that CP Group has the scale, the skills, and most importantly, the mindset to lead and succeed. Thank you. Now, data and digital technology is one of the greatest enablers of a fast and inclusive transition. And of course, also a growing source of emissions in its own right. At the start of this year, Microsoft came out with a head-turning ambition to be carbon negative by 2030 and to remove all the carbon the company has emitted since it was founded in 1975. Since then, we've had the COVID pandemic and we've had protests about racial inequality. So Brad, as a technology leader, how have you seen the momentum towards a zero carbon economy grow since your own commitment? And in light of recent events, do you see the issues of climate, health and equality coming together? Uh, Nigel, it's a great question. And I think 2020 has really been a remarkable year for so many reasons, obviously not all of which are positive. Even amid COVID-19, we're seeing enormous momentum really spread across the business sector. Um, we were part of the start of the year in January with the announcement that you mentioned, uh, but every month we've seen more companies stepping up and committing to similarly, I think, ambitious goals. Uh, I do think one of the realizations of the year does come from data, as you say, uh, and it is the connection between climate issues, between health issues, and between equity issues. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, that's been a heightened focus in the United States, given the importance of racial equity and that conversation this year. Um, certainly one of the things that's caused us to reflect upon is the fact that Black Americans are exposed to 50% more airborne pollutants than their white counterparts. Uh, it's part of what inspired us to announce just two months ago a new initiative with a company called Soul Systems. And working together, we're going to bring to the market 500 megawatts of solar energy, solar energy that will serve communities of color and that will be purchased with a priority from companies that are run by people of color. I think this is just one small slice of what in fact is really the future for all of us, uh, which is working in greater collaboration across the business community and with NGOs and governments to have standardized measurements, uh, to be working together on supply chain management, to really be taking all of the steps that we're going to need to take. Uh, but in a year that maybe has given more cause for concern than optimism, I do believe this is a source of optimism. Great, thanks Brad. That's a great, really great example of a kind of some surprising shifts um, in the face of the COVID crisis. So Brad, there was an open letter published last week signed by the CEOs and company presidents calling on the EU Commission and heads of state and government to back up the level of ambition set out in their Green Deal by reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Uh, I know that Microsoft was among the signatories and fortunately it seems that the EU has been listening. Can you tell us why it's so important that businesses engage on climate policy? Well, we clearly need governments 
to step forward and act not only with bold ambition, but in a more unified and collaborative way. Um, you know, carbon is like COVID. It doesn't respect boundaries. Literally, once it's released into the air, it spreads around the world. The only way for us to meet the critical carbon reduction goals that we have to meet by the middle of this century uh, is for governments to work more closely together and for a real spirit of multi-stakeholderism. Um, so that's what we're hoping to see in short from this. Uh, I do think it gives us the opportunity to build on all of the sustainability efforts that need to come together. Uh, part of it is reducing carbon. Uh, that's why we said we'll be carbon negative by 2030. Uh, it's also connected to another step that we're announcing today that will be water positive by 2030. And that requires that we reduce our water consumption in large part by relying more on renewable energy. That will help significantly, uh, but also by making investments in replenishing water um, you know, in wetlands, in forests and the like. Uh, I just think it's all a reflection in some ways of how interconnected by definition the ecosystems of the world are and by definition, how we all have to work together if we're going to be successful. Well, great, thanks, but I think that's a wonderful example of um, the kind of moves that we're seeing from business leaders like yourselves towards what many are calling the regenerative economy, an economy where um, every generation leaves the world a better place for the generation that follows. So thank you for your leadership um, and for the great strides that Microsoft are taking. Well, thank you, Nigel, obviously for your leadership as well. And thanks for the opportunity to join in this. Um, this is an important time and it's great to have the opportunity for us to reflect together uh, on how we all need to come together. Our final panelist brings us a very important perspective as one of the world's biggest consumer brands. And with that, an insight into where consumers are in their support for the race to zero. Jean-Paul, L'Oreal has committed globally to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Can you tell us about the carbon reduction journey that you've been on and what actions the company has taken and plans to take to reach this significant milestone? Yes, absolutely. You know, the, uh, this journey has been, a, has been a long journey and very exciting uh, uh, and very important journey. So we started with this ambition uh, and this vision that uh, the, the number one in the beauty industry, L'Oreal, has also to be exemplary in terms of sustainability because obviously we have to contribute to make the planet uh, more beautiful or keep it beautiful. So we started in 2013 with a, with a very important program called uh, Sharing Beauty with All, where we took some very strong commitments uh, to 2020, uh, which was to reduce by 60% our carbon emissions. And in fact, seven, seven years after uh, now, uh, we, have, uh, we have gone even further. Uh, we reduce our carbon emission by 80% uh, in total and we are still uh, making progress and in fact we uh, we we did uh, we changed completely the whole business model of l'oreal uh, on all aspects production uh, research uh, distribution everything and also the way that we conceive our products you know for for now every product that we do that we market and you know we sell seven billion products a year uh, around the planet so it's a it's a, it's a huge transformation every new product that we create has to have a positive impact either in terms of sustainability or, or social impact and so we we did that and uh, as you know very well now it's uh, 2020 you no know, so now it's time to go even further and to commit to another program and that's why we launched this year the the plan uh, l'oreal for the future uh, this is very very ambitious uh, again even more ambitious and, uh, and, and we think that it's very urgent, you know, we, we, we know that all experts say that we, we collectively have one decade to act. Uh, if not, it's going to be too late. So that's why we are really accelerating. And the new program really aims for a, a very radical transformation of our, uh, the way we do our, our job between now and 2030. 
And the, what we want to do is to put lawyer in line with the only possible scenario for humanity, which are the planetary boundaries. And so the, uh, the objective for 2030 is to align our green gas emission to the plus uh, 1.5 uh, degree uh, scenario. So what are we going to do? We're going <clears> to <throat> we're going to be very ambitious on this. We have already today uh, 40 uh, sites that are carbon neutral, <clears throat> and we have made a commitment that by 2025, every site that we have at L'Oréal, production site, uh, distribution, uh, research, uh, offices, everything. Uh, will be uh, carbon neutral. Uh, that's in five years from now, so it's a, it's a super important commitment. And this will be done without absolutely any recourse to offsetting mechanism and only by reducing our energy consumption and using local sources of uh, renewable energy. And also, we will reduce by 50% per finished product all our green gas emissions for scopes one, two, and three, uh, and, and you know very well that the scope three is the most difficult one. Uh, and, uh, and in order to do that, uh, we will address all the issues upstream with uh, transportation and suppliers and downstream, of course, with our consumers. So it's a huge transformation again for L'Oreal. And um, on top of everything, we have also decided to uh, pledge this year in the, in the Loyal for the Future Plan, 100 million euros uh, for uh, environmental impact investing. 50 million will be allocated to the regeneration of damaged uh, natural ecosystems. And 50 million will be directed at financing projects that are linked to the circular economy. So as you can see, very ambitious, very committed. Great. Let's let's talk now about how you take consumers with you. Um, you know, how much do consumers care about these kind of sustainability actions, especially given everything the world's contending with right now? And how do you use the the power of L'Oreal's you know iconic global brand and your portfolio of customer brands to educate and inspire consumers to take them? with you to join your sustainability efforts and to accelerate the overall market momentum towards the zero carbon future. You know, you're right, it's super important. So first, consumers are, are more and more conscious uh, of the environmental and social challenges. We, we do that very well around the world. Uh, and there is a growing appetite uh, for uh, products and services that are uh, definitely responsible and sustainable. Uh, and the desire is obviously uh, especially strong amongst younger generations. So it's, as you said, it's the role of companies like L'Oreal uh, to lead the way and first to provide them with sustainable options and tools to align their consumptions uh, choice with their values. Uh, and so exactly as you said, our ultimate goal is to engage uh, our more than 1 billion consumers around the world in our journey and help them uh, limit their own environmental impact when they use our products. So how do we do that? We, uh, several ways. First way, of course, as I said, we have completely reinvented the way we conceive our products. So every product now at L'Oreal must have a positive uh, impact in terms of uh, sustainability. And so, for example, this year, in 2020, more than 95% of the new products that we launch will have this positive impact. And the objective is to reach 100%, but we are not far. Uh, secondly, we are very important also, we are helping our consumers to choose the most sustainable products in our portfolio. So for that, we developed uh, a new product environmental and social impact labeling system. Uh, which is critical to help them make their, their right choices. This method has been uh, uh, endorsed by scientific experts, and the first brand that will implement it will be uh, Garnier, but uh, the other brands like L'Oréal, uh, uh, Lancôme, Maybelline, etc., will, uh, will follow very quickly. And third, uh, we are uh, continuing to innovate in product design uh, to to carry this uh, sustainability in the consumer use phase. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is super important because uh, the carbon emission in the use phase comes mainly uh, 
I don't know if you know from uh, the conception of energy uh, needed, for example, to heat water for rinsing products. Uh, so we will uh, conceive differently our products. We will educate the consumers in order for them to reduce and uh, their consumption. And, and the objective is by 2030, uh, we will have uh, enable uh, our consumers to reduce the, the greenhouse emissions by 25% uh, compared to 2016, uh, which is already a big, uh, big change per finished product. And also on the plastic side, because it's, uh, it's also very, very important, we have committed that by 2030, 100% of our plastic, all our plastics uh, used in our packaging will be either from uh, recycled or uh, bio-based sources. Uh, and uh, as you said, our 36 brands have committed to these uh, actions in partnership with uh, NGOs uh, in order to go uh, as far as possible and as quickly uh, as possible. And just to finish, maybe I would like to say also that it's, uh, it's not only uh, you know, the, uh, an effort and a will to change the way we do, but it's also a, a, a will to be exemplary and to take the whole industry with us to take, uh, of course, uh, suppliers, uh, customers, uh, retailers, and, and also, of course, competitors, because uh, if we uh, if we lead the way uh, in the right direction, I think that we will be followed. Great. Well, thank you, Jean-Paul. I really admire the way you've embraced the science. So you set science-based targets. You've you've figured out that we're going to have to operate within planetary boundaries and use that as a constraint to drive innovation. I think you know putting putting the constraint in the design stage. That, that's already a really big, 95% already. Also, I think you really exemplified the need to take a long-term target and then break it down into very concrete actions in the next five years. So you're not talking about something that will happen after you've after, you know, no, after no. you've handed over to the next CEO, it's on your watch. And finally, I love that. I love the idea of um, what I call systems leadership, where you're not just thinking about your business, but your whole value chain and the way you influence consumers and even your competitors, as you say. So. What, wonderful to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining the Race to Zero and for sharing your journey with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Wow. Let me thank all the leaders from our panel for their work in driving the inevitable transition to the zero carbon economy. It's great to see their leadership driving systemic transformation at an accelerating pace. And as proof of that, a major report published today called Nearing Net Zero by the New Climate Institute charts the enormous rise in actors setting the highest level of climate ambition to reach net zero by the 2040s against the backdrop of COVID-19. So far, cities and regions with a footprint greater than the emissions of the United States, alongside companies with a combined revenue of over $11.4 trillion, are all pursuing net zero emissions. I'm delighted to say that as of today, the Race to Zero campaign encompasses 22 regions, 452 cities, 1,128 businesses, 548 universities, and 45 of the world's biggest investors. And entries to the race are set to grow exponentially, particularly with the launch of a new platform by the International Chamber of Commerce and Exponential Roadmap called the SME Climate Hub where they will be providing the tools for small and medium-sized enterprises to join the Race to Zero campaign. These companies, which represent over 90% of businesses worldwide and employ 2 billion people, have of course been among the hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic and will be integral to our collective efforts to reach net zero emissions. So the direction of travel is clear, momentum is building, and Gonzalo and myself are calling on all cities and regions, all investors and businesses, all schools, universities and sports clubs to join the race to zero, a race we can only win together. Finally, let me say a huge thank you to Helen and all the team at the Climate Group, all of our speakers and all of our partners for collaborating with us on this event in the spirit of radical collaboration, which so many are modelling. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the COP25 president, Chilean minister, Carolina Schmidt. Thank you, Nigel.
It brings me great joy to see the growing numbers of companies, cities, states, regions, investors, and universities that have raved around our mission to reach net zero by 2050. We launched the Climate Ambition Alliance one year ago, bringing together for the first time states and non-state actors committed to net zero emissions. It was the largest ever alliance committed to achieving carbon neutrality and since COP25, it has grown through the race to zero. The acceleration of commitments during the global pandemic show us that companies, cities, states, regions, investors, and universities across the world know that the twin challenges of tackling climate change and coronavirus go hand in hand. As we work to recover from this pandemic, the relationship between states and non-state actors will play a crucial role in our future success. Enhanced government commitments through their national determined contributions can help us unlock investments and spur job creation, expand green sectors, and help us build towards a healthy, resilient recovery. And with the SME Climate Hub, we can look forward to seeing exponential growth as companies from all over the world, large and small, can join us in our race to a healthier and more resilient future. Our green recovery has the potential to be a significant turning point in our fight against climate change as we work collectively to build a better future for all humanity. I am proud to say that the race to zero is truly underway. Thank you.